Politics and Transformation uh, seminar series. So um, we're, we've got a, a um, Mellon Foundation grant that allows us to invite these wonderful people to come speak to us, as, as well as to engage with our postgraduate students. Um, Bernard Doubles, a colleague, and, and I have been talking uh, about the new book of, of John and Jean that you all know about. Uh, the truth about crime. We were speaking to the honor students about this, and we're very pleased to be able to host Professors John and Jean Komroff, Professor Ashil Mbembe, and Professor Sarah Nuttall. I was going to introduce them more fully, but I realize the, the numbers indicate that you know who they are, that's <laughs> why you're here. <laughs> and it's really fantastic to have you all here. And the idea is we'll have two um, commentators. On, on the book, uh, Sarah and Ashil, and then uh, John and Jean will respond. And let's just go straight into it. And I'm sure you'll, you'll find it really interesting and worthwhile. There is, if people want to sit, you can, there is space. Yeah. Shall I go? Please. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. If you can't hear me, I'm going to shout, but there is a mic here that I could use if you needed to. So let me try. But the format's very awkward sitting down and not being able to see all of you, but I'll try. Um, so Steve, thanks for convening this. Thanks to Anne for getting us here. And thanks to Dean and John for um, a really quite extraordinary book. The latest of many, um, which I have uh, read every word of and immensely enjoyed. As always, for the force of its arguments, but also for the power of its prose. It's extremely pleasurable. Um, across so many rubrics, from uh, the clutches of the psychic, also as always, um, it never escaped me for a minute that reading this book is akin to reading a detective story. Um, and I do consider Dean and John super cops of a certain kind <laughs> <laughs> um, and anthropologists of the highest order. And they certainly play on that um, resonance throughout the book. Um, I um, want to make some remarks that, that enable those of you in the audience who've not read the book to get a sense of what the book is trying to do. And so I, I pull out the arguments as I go along. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm very fascinated with the, the, the mode of detection that you use. At the heart of this book is, in fact, the Edgar Allan Poe story, which was the first and best detective story of its kind. Um, and that was a story about things <coughs> that were hidden in plain sight. It's a story that's been subject to tremendous uh, criticism and deconstruction. It's a story about methods of deduction and about floating signifiers that we ought to um, attribute meaning to. It's a, it's, a, it's a tremendously exciting story that I think is at the heart of the book in terms of the strategies that you employ. Is uh, the letter, um, uh, it, 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 does the letter lack meaning or is the lack the meaning? Thinking about questions of poetry in relation to surve surveillance, which is the superior form, thinking about imperiled manhood. Now, varying away from some of the deconstructive uh, ex excesses that this story has been subject to, you turn very firmly to the focus. Um, um, and so it is that you write, thinking about crime is inseparable from thinking about truth and from thinking about the social. Here you recall Durkheim's assertion that a society free of lawlessness would fall into chaos since it would be bereft of the signs of its own existence as an authoritative order. In a sense, a society needs lawlessness and indeed crime in order to prove to itself what it truly is. Now, in order to get at the social, we might, you suggest, draw on practices as diverse as Sherlock Holmes's practices of detection um, as a form of feeling backwards, or Walter Benjamin's notion of reading Debru for clues to histories of transgression, in this case, criminal transgression. Now, one question I want to put to you, Dean and John, um, and I'll come to this again further on, is um, if reading the social is key to detecting the nature of the crime, as it were, um, what is your decision not to include in your book any accounts of the crime scene as such leave or leave, or leave out? And I have here in mind um, the intense sociality of crime as such. And I wanted to give you a quick example um, of, <coughs> of, of that. Um, Martha Visser wrote this very interesting book called Lost and Found in Johannesburg. In the middle of that book, in fact, in the middle of the moment he's writing it, there's a section called The Effect. And other critics have talked about the way in which that section is kind of plummeted into that text. I have a different reading, which is how consistent um, that moment of attack is with the South African sociality that happens across the book and it happens across your book. And I wanted to remind you very briefly, for reasons I'll come to in a moment, 
uh, some of the things that happen in that in that in that segment, the Martha vs. Book, which is after all a rather rare ethnography of the crime scene uh, by a victim of the time. It's quite extraordinary that um, Mark and his friends are watching a, 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 a cable program called The Slap, and there's a lot of domestic noise at that particular moment. And at that very particular moment, there's domestic noise in the flat in Johannesburg as three guys come into the flat um, and uh, with wielding guns and set up a crime scene. Mark says right from the beginning, before I even knew what I was doing, words were leaving my mouth and rising uh, against their own words. And what goes on to happen is, of course, this intense sociality across the barrel of a gun. And so at one point, um, the, um, uh, one of the women who is with him says to one of the criminals in the scene, you know, I just made a cup of tea, so could I just have a sip of a cup of tea before you gag me? And further on, when one of the women is sexually assaulted on the way to get into the safe, she's then offered a, a purse of fruit juice and milk. Um, and is told to take her clothes rather gently back in. And it's just extraordinary in the sense that, 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 that crime as sociality and the sociality of crime has a great deal to tell us, I think, um, and would have been an interesting addition in some respects uh, to, 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 the, to the book. Um, I, um, I, I see the book as an argument that turns on the complexity of truth and wants to diagnose rather than participate in, quote, South Africa's almost compulsive tendency to return to the scene of the crime can't really get into crime scenes as such. But I think this question about the sociality of crime is one that I want to ask you nevertheless. Crime as social form um, um, and as a form of oppression. This leads me to a second line of argument I want to pick up on, which is the second move you make as I see it. That the truth about crime, for all its ambiguities and paradoxes, reveals to us in all sorts of fundamental <coughs> ways the truth about South Africa. Um, uh, which I take to mean a series of truths about the South African real, even as the real is shot through with the unreal, uh, under conditions of what we call increasing inscrutability, according to my famous phrase in the book, which is the neoliberated South Africa. Mm. I find your diagnosis, your depiction, your reading of contemporary South Africa riveting and convincing, and I recognize it in as my own South Africa, except for one or two differences which I'm going to talk to. The first is just to, 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 to signal to people here what it is about South Africa that you have to say. One of the things you say is that uh, in, a, in a chapter which explores divine depression and the complex, complex forensics of Oswald's crime scene, you invoke a South African who's graphically encountered as being undone, a South Africa that now seems to be in riotous motion, driven by a heady mix of enfranchisement, eroding boundaries, consumer desire, and entrepreneurial incitement. You consider, too, that in the South Africa of the now, there may be no recoverable grammar, no way of connecting with surface adherence to the enduring social fact or process free uh, of crime detection, right? At least not by this usual rational means. And here you recall for us the long uh, colonial struggle to impose the rule of law on the Afrika Man Khanis. Now, key, I move to three questions now, and I'll finish. Key to all of, all of your arguments is that the line between law and its transgression, between protect, protector and predator, between cops and criminals seems almost infinitely permeable, always spectral, constantly open to negotiation. And finally, you suggest across the book as a whole and repeatedly that the open secret hiding in plain sight to return to the code story and the play of surface and depth at stake in the work of detection is that it is not only South Africa, but the late modern liberal state in general that is in less and less able to secure social order or control crime at all. Um, only made more obvious by some view, uh, recent terror attacks across the north. I caught myself the other day um, figuring out how not to have a van drive into my daughter in the South African street. Three questions I want to pose to you, um, none of which get away from your key arguments, but which are going to prod something, which is there are so many South Africans. One issue I wanted to ask you more about is this. You write so convincingly <coughs> about how the line between law and lawlessness, licit and illicit, entrepreneurial and extra legal is so thin, how cops are treated literally, how cop stations in the Western Cape Cape have 82 bu panic buttons under their desk. <laughs> How lawlessness is imminent everywhere, etc. Um, now, one of the things I wonder about, even if it seems counterintuitive <coughs> at first, is whether there is a missing piece here, which has to do with the extent to which zones which are often taken, perhaps by academics in particular, as exceptional zones or states of exception, are in fact the opposite, are in fact quite the legalized zones. That they represent not a degrading collapse of the law, but the workings of impeccable legal opinion by a smart but right-wing legal jurisprudence. And I wanted to ask one of these questions in particular. It seems to me when you, when it, it, it's most obviously 
uh, 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 clear that we should ask this question in relation to U.S. examples, which is a parallel example in law. But mm -hmm. think about Guantanamo Bay, think about the Torture Memo. There's a long legal opinion on whether it's uh, okay or not to drop an insert into a cell uh, which contains a man who kills other people. And so I wanted to ask Ron about the social pathology of the law, um, which I think is, is, not, is, is, not, is not so much in that book. Um, one should think about the health of social home affairs in South Africa, that in fact, the immigrants shot through with a certain kind of pathologiology. That's my first question. Secondly, do you think, perhaps for Jean, more fully, there may be generational aspects to the sense that we live in a world that's increasingly inscrutable? On one level of contentment, the new complexity of late capitalism, the new and multiple repertoires of the self and its surrogates via social media, the proliferation of crime and terrorism, the new softwares and switches we adopt, all of this makes perfect sense. But we, if we are as self-critical as possible, does each new generation become at certain points illegible to the next? For a very young person coming of age, does the world not seem more detectable than ever before? Consult Google for almost anything you want to know. Knowledge itself no longer confined to universities, but is widely searchable, so we may still need universities in order to think. Um, um, areas now uh, formerly opaque, now traceable, transparent, searchable, diagnosable. Perhaps even reporting on crime is easier than it ever has been before. And then thirdly, the question of the many South Africans. I am not sure that for the majority of citizens in Fontaine, middle class black people in particular, lawlessness is the language for thinking the now. I think that opportunity is, and not just the ways in which lawlessness and opportunity go together, a point you make repeatedly in the book. I suggest that dinner party conversations in South Africa's large other than white suburbs are not necessarily using crime and criminality as a filter for knowing the present, that it may or may not be incidental to other conversations that structure the everyday, even the future. And I wanted to talk to you about this, and I wanted to ask you the question of, um, you know, how little do we actually know about the social side? point you make, but it seems to me that we are particularly unable to account for the ways in which middle class black South Africans, perhaps the city of Johannesburg at large across race, is thinking about crime and metaphorical, and, and the metaphysics of this order, um, perhaps along different lines of discourse and conversations than the ones that you have uh, written about here. The crimes of whiteness, sure, the ills of Zuma and his cronies, for sure, absolutely, which speak directly or indirectly to your argument, but also still, you know, Education's the key to success. Technology is the future of everything. Mobility across multiple registries. Do we know? Do we know the truth of this social? I'm not so sure we do, or we can speak to it yet. And I'm going to take the last minute, Steve, if that's okay. I haven't got the time to ask two questions that are of great importance to me and I know to you. One of them is a question about the status of the self, the present, which I think we're pressing after all the time, particularly after we finish the book, so it's a time and day. Um, one of the things that you don't comment on in Anthony Ellsworth and Stellenbosch's book is, of course, the move in the criminal justice system um, in, in South Africa around transition from confession, which in fact the police were got very good at, by the way, it's fantastic, by the way, um, to forensics, uh, uh, which they are hapless and relentlessly doing. Um, and I wonder whether either forensics is the new form of confession or whether um, um, we really are beginning to think with quite different orders of the self spreads across so many surrogates um, and also increasingly self-employed in, in terms of algorithm and policing. So I, I wonder whether the scene of the crime isn't moving to other kinds of you know, logics of selfhood, abstraction, and computational patterns altogether, a particular challenge for the left and for any reader of South Africa and the world at large. And my very final question um, is in relation to the nature of the social. And I want to ask you a question I asked you before, but I want to ask it again. Your argument rests um, so much on this question of the social, the truth of the social, the question of what to exclude with the social. Um, but also the degree to which the social has become incredibly inscrutable. You bear witness to that fact in all kinds of ways. Now, do you still subscribe to Bertrand's view? This is what Bertrand says about the social. Society may thus be seen as that total unit beyond which nothing else exists. The whole which includes all things, that supreme class under which all classes must be subsumed. Ultimately, I want to finish by asking you um, about whether we should still take the social as a container, as a social context, context off which we read all kinds of things, whether it's literature um, or evidence of a particular kind, or must we now think of the social as a much more multi mu multinational, a contingent and volatile network of association? And what would be the implications of that for your argument of that time? So thank you very much. I hope thank I have not well. spoken for too long. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. very much. Ray.
first of all, uh, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, yet another, uh, another um, really uh, powerful book, uh, which, as Sarah said, uh, is written, and for those of you who, who have become familiar with uh, Jim and John's writing, it's written in a uh, rather different, uh, uh, let's say, structure this time. Uh, it, it, it's the most cinematic of your books, uh, I, I would say. Um, the writing is very cinematic, uh, which means extremely lively, um, um, uh, both argumentative and, uh, uh, and, and extremely hospitable, uh, in the sense that you, you, you really make a room for, for the reader uh, in, in this house uh, that, that the book is. Uh, I would like to, to mention that because these questions of, of writing uh, are back uh, on, on the agenda uh, or uh, the kind of, of work we do, um, uh, especially in an age when, when, uh, when new, new technologies uh, have given uh, way to uh, forms of writing that uh, are more and more fragmented and fractured uh, it's very uh, uh, comforting to uh, to read a book like like this. The book is also, in fact, um, um, a powerful interpretation of, of of the world as as it goes today. Uh, um, if you want to know uh, what is coming uh, in terms of the complex systems that are emerging, I think you 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 better read th this book. It goes far beyond the question of crime uh, loosely uh, understood. Um, I, I just have two, two comments, uh, and they are related to uh, some of the concepts that figure both in the title of the book and uh, in the overall arguments. First of all, the concept of truth, and uh, the other one, which is on the title, that of knowledge. Um, we, we used to believe that uh, one of the functions of knowledge was to, to lead us to, to truth. Um, and that, in fact, the um, truth is, is basically what, what would free us, that the, the path to freedom and, and, and therefore to democracy and uh, 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 a social order that uh, attends to the well-being of, of the humans, the path was through knowledge which would lead to the truth. Um, <coughs> my feeling is that we, one of the, the, uh, the biggest transformations uh, today is, is that, uh, I mean, truth doesn't necessarily lead to knowledge. Uh, knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to truth any longer. And that, in fact, the two concepts have been somewhat delinked. Um, um, they have been delinked in the sense that uh, truth doesn't require knowledge uh, any longer. Um, um, you know, just as justice doesn't require a trial. Um, uh, that we are entering in an epoch uh, characterized by uh, the reign of truth without evidence. That, that all, of, all of those things, I mean, of course we still refer to them, but they are no longer really important in the uh, production of whatever one believes is truthful. And um, uh, if that is the case, if it is the case that, in fact, evidence empirical stuff is no longer uh, that important in terms of what we believe is truthful. Um, what kind of social order is it that um, uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, allows for? Um, um, what does it uh, entail in terms of, let's say, the, uh, the, the future of some of those social forms we, we, we were uh, uh, um, invested in, uh, democracy for, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
that's the first uh, set of questions uh, I think that came to my mind in uh, reading, reading your book. We don't really have the time to, to go through the details, but I would like to put that uh, question here uh, uh, on the table. The second thing has to do, of course, with, with knowledge itself. Um, the, uh, it seems to me that we are witnessing a, a set of reconfigurations of what counts as knowledge today. Uh, Sarah mentioned al algorithmic reason, um, but there are many other factors that are concurring uh, to uh, the re reconfiguration of, of what kind what counts as knowledge. Uh, knowledge has always been tied, as we know, to the requisite of empirical validation, uh, in the sense that knowledge, that which is, uh, can be validated empirically, that which has undergone uh, a methodical, hopefully systematic process uh, uh, of, of verification. And, and, and we used to understand that there is knowledge that is free from, from these constraints. Um, uh, now, uh, something else is going on in this epoch, which seems to be in search for, for deterministic uh, models of, of human be behavior and, and, and de uh, decision making, uh, uh, in the sense that knowledge is, is reduced to uh, an understanding of, of what lies behind people's decision making, their responses to to marketing, uh, the figures of the citizen, the consumer, publics, and their behavior, so forth and so on. Um, uh, if that is indeed the case, uh, how does it help us to, uh, let's say, um, reframe what you call the truth of crime? Uh, 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 if, if indeed, I mean, all of this is basically, pre quote unquote, predetermined. Uh, those are the two, uh, let's say, questions uh, I wanted to, to, to bring to the discussion in the eight minutes uh, I was allocated. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll see some minutes to you. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Sarah and Ashu. So, Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Can you hear us at the back? Oh, there's some. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure, it's recording is not, not, not a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want us yeah. to stand up? <coughs> no, I think, yeah. I think that will be better. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not Shout as if you were preaching. Shout. Yeah. I'll try. Thanks so much, both of you. And there's a very interesting resonance between the sets of questions. So I'm going to try and mix it up a little bit, if you don't mind. And I'm going to start with something that you raised, Sarah, and link it to Ashil, because there was a lovely sense of con return from the opening questions about forensics and Durkheim through to the question of what constitutes truth and how does it. And these are, you know, these are questions about which we all agonize. Huh? Mm -hmm. So so these are kind of they're discursive ideas that we that we we're throwing out here and it's wonderful to think with what you've raised. Look I think the way in which we started this whole enterprise and the question of what constituted truth was in a moment precisely of the one that you gestured towards us here. Um, and that is a world in which, and it was before we started writing this, before the advent of false news and this whole kind of crisis of authority <laughs> as to what constituted believability in any kind of form of knowledge. But already in a world in which it was very clear that on the one hand we had a move towards absolutism or an effort for the security of forms of knowledge that we sometimes call fundamental. So whether we're thinking about them in terms of religious commitments and the fact that very often people who moved to in any faith we, we, we know in all the world religions have their more kind of foundationist forms these days and have had for a while since the late 20th century at least. Um, and, and many of the people who are drawn to these forms of faith claim that they give them a certain kind of surety, a stone you can touch in a world where everything is shifting. Now, I think a lot of this yeah, has always been inherent in the nature of modernism. The shift between the kind of sense that there are absolutist forms of knowledge or sovereignty, and this book is in some ways 
about the quest for sovereignty. Don't ask us because we are asking Australia about the truth. But we're not only asking what is the truth about South Africa, but what do people take to be truth in South Africa? And where do they look to to try and find it? So it's ways of asserting truth, and it's the way in which crime and the undecidability of that line, mm -hmm. the fact that drawing the line between law and lawlessness is almost the genesis of society in the way we understand it in a modern world founded on law. And that line becomes ever more difficult to draw for a variety of reasons, but a lot because of what constitutes truth and its forms of underpinning, its forms of, if you like, authorization. Right? And that has to do with sovereignty of one kind or another. So at one, at one end of it, we have this notion of sovereignty. It's either God-given theology, or we were talking about this earlier, the kind of truth, for instance, that Foucault talks about in the clinic. Death is the one thing we know. The body on the slab is where life ends. And that's the one thing that links all human beings. And against that fixity, we will measure the relativities of life, its meaning, the passage towards death, and so on. So, so that's another kind of materialism of truth. On the other hand, we have the world of relativism. Humanism is always, in a sense, perspectival. It's the world which human beings make. It's a world that's made by history. It's a world where, in fact, anthropology talks about cultural difference. It's a world of Derrida and postmodernism, where there's no sentence that is ever the same the second time, and everything is shifting, and there are always multiple signifiers. And between these two, you know, is, 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 is the domain of what might be, it be normal, relativized, uh, 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 um, um, fact-finding and empirical knowledge of the sociological kind. So the, 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 the world of Durkheim. Right? We don't know the truth of society from God because God is a relative construction. He is not a materialist. You can't discern the social from the biophysical. Mm -hmm. But you know it in terms of something which appears to be a kind of lawlessness that makes society impossible. And so we use deviance and law-breaking to tell you what are the minimal conditions of social being. Now, let me say from the beginning, we are not Durkheimians. We are not taking Durkheim. We are taking Durkheim as a statement of the modern world in which, in the humanist world, society is man-made but also rule-governed and orderly. Right? And you, a social fact is something we can only know in terms of the social. Right? And so what we're interested in is how that insight relates to criminality in a, so in, in a, so a sociological context where the assumption is you can find out the truth of who done it. You can find out who makes a, 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 a criminal act in the world, right? who creates social facts in the world by reading the surface facts, right? the, the, the evidence forensically, because there is a systematic nature to society. It has a logic and a rule. And you can tell right, from the evidence left if you think in terms of the logic of society back to its cause, there's the form of social reasoning, which we call forensics. Mm. And that form of detection is, 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 it was, was, was symbolized above all else in the 19th century in crime writing. Mm. And the idea there is you can get to the, you can find out who did it, the world is knowable and has rules and is scrutable, if you like, if you use the kind of evidence that you know about how it works. So you can see a particular crime let, uh, 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 um, piece of evidence left at a crime scene, and you can deduce back who it belonged to and why they were there. And that, the Carlo Ginsburg and his, his Freudian talks about as a kind of semiotic form of reason for the form of social inference that becomes the normal way of coming to truth in that middle space between everything being relative and things being absolute in a way that you can never know. So in that sense, it seems to me that, that what we're talking about in this book is why it is right, that that balance that knowable world, the fiction that society could be known if we, through principles of understanding how it works, its politics, its economy, its tension, the way in which social uh, and institutions and largely democratic modes of states were organized, that on the basis of that, right, we could locate events, knowing that they were provisional. This is modern history. Right? This is not something that existed in medieval times. It's not something that God tells us. There's no absolute form of truth, but it has conventions. So, so, so in that sense, it seems to me what we, we are trying to ask in this book is what is it, and we talk about the tectonic shift in the relationship between the nation state, forms of capital, yeah, and, and the way in which law operates in that context, particularly criminal law, and its forms of evidence and known, right? And that that shift seems to have blurred the line in, in a way that, that appears to be different 
in, in degree, if not kind, from what mm. existed before. Yeah? And because the, the, the world of the modern is linked so much to the security of the law, to be able to draw the line between mm. law and lawless, to be able to discern <coughs> from any event in the world, if you do discern the structures of what it leaves behind, you should be able to, if you know the place from where those people, that crime is coming from, you should be able to work out logically according to the state thereof. And this seems to be increasingly impossible. Yeah. And the question is why? Now, a couple of quick things um, in, in relation to what you, you were saying, uh, Ken, and it, it began. This is sociological because in a world of, and I use that very generally, um, in, in the world of modern humanism, it implies these are things that human beings make. These are reasonably orderly and systematic systems of society, culture, uh, uh, you know, states, uh, uh, crime, whatever, that have a logic that comes. But the book itself is not implying um, that all that goes on, even within its context, but within, for instance, the state of crime, can be understood sociologically. Yeah. But there are limits. For instance, we, I would not be a good Heine because I'm also a kind Marxist or post-Marxist. I believe that the material terms of the organization of production and distribution have a lot to do with the way societies are organized. I don't believe there's any strain of socialist or green strain of socialist. It mediates the material world. Mm -hmm. I believe, for instance, that aspects of the way in which environmental degradations are happening in our world yeah, are not truly, they have social causes to a large degree, but not only. Yeah. The, 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 this is a world which is multifactorial. There is always a material, social, but psychoanalytic. There's a lot within this book that is interesting in the deep psychosis of addiction. Mm. That, for instance, in a country like society, uh, South Africa, yeah, bear its history deeply into the present. And what, how do you begin to understand what is crime? What is law? How relative are they? For whom does the law work? What do, what are the crimes that lie on the surface of our society? Yeah. How do you read things like murder rates in terms of a long history of colonialism? Mm. Yeah. And how do you relativize? So, so, so and, and those things have deep psychoanalytic dimensions that I think we're also trying to get at here. The aesthetic, the filmic, the multi-dimensional moment, the moment of new media that in fact restricted entirely the way in which this older sociology worked. Then you begin to understand the kind of close distance of the ways in which new forms of communication operate, and particularly with the decentering of the state that was central to the neo neoliberal moment. And one of the things we're talking about in this book is the degree to which the whole architecture of liberal institutions and the way in which they held the line as to what was truth, how did you authorize it, whose views did you believe, who could stand behind the law, what was sovereign. And that has shifted dramatically in a contemporary world, not least because of the ways in which sovereignty has changed, states have increasingly ruled um, in relation to markets and corporations. We live in a world here of, of, of state capture. We know exactly what that means in terms of the question of of how we begin to understand sovereignty, how we begin to think about the law and its enforceability, how it is that increasingly we're living in a world where the bourgeois law or liberal law is regarded as superfluous mm -hmm. to the ways in which states are being run. Mm -hmm. The degree to which the sovereignty of the state and the idea of law and order is now shared yeah. by privatized security, the operation of markets, the rule of NGOs, the rule of international organizations, the ways in which facts and news and, and statistics are made through mechanisms that are both electronic and mediated and have to do with the operation of transnational markets. All of those things make the space in which we live and what constitutes the social very difficult to think at all. And this is where, I think, the significance of the old-fashioned crime paradigm comes in. Yeah. That the, the crime story was a kind of a mediated way of thinking about society, order, justice, and the triumph ultimately of some kind of form of continuously recognizable law. And we held it to ourselves in late 19th century Britain when the society was suddenly opening up and new kinds of people, new populations were emerging and we, our, our world didn't seem moribund. And the logic of the crime story seems to be something that you could impose so that you knew who the good people were, mm -hmm. who the bad people were, how you produced order. It gave us a sense that our world was noble. This is not the first time <coughs> that things are blurred. Mm -hmm. yeah. And post-apartheid South Africa is blurred for all kinds of complicated reasons that you allu allude to. Yeah. But it's blurred in ways that I think have, are, are unprecedented in yeah. terms of the story that we tell. But the kinds of ways in which we read even the crime story now in the late uh, um, 
appreciate the good thing that you're saying to me. Money are much more cellular, much more raw. They, 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 they're going to see that the world is pollutable and noble in the same way, and that law can easily be put back into place. So what we do is to use those things. Therefore, that is the ways in which I can try and think highly process it. In, the, it's in our, our, our outgoings around times that we don't seem to understand or we feel we can't adequately police, it's the natural style of the times that we have here around the iconic figures from the kinds of murders like there is a lot murder in this town to the Pretoria story to Victoria Boo Boo, all of those all fit itself into raised questions. Who are we? Who are these people? Where is the law here? And can we ever draw the line here? between law and law issues. Are they enforceable? Who are we? But we are not unique in this. And that's the other thing that I think we were saying earlier. South Africans feel they're uniquely entrenched, living a crime scene, both because of the crime of human history and because of the kind of world we've created in which, despite all the promise, the inequality and the lack of accessibility for large sections of the population remains so great that the law itself sometimes seems a fiction or seems illegitimate. And we see, therefore, that there's a whole social side behind it, a productive side behind it, that is very hard simply to condemn. But the fact is, very similar things are going on in many other places, and not only transitional, you know, post-socialist places and post-totalitarian places. And so, in a way, I think we have to be both very alive to what is exceptional about us and what is not exceptional about us. And, and to see both the, the realities of our situation in terms of its own moving uh, 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 appreciation for what we are, how we begin to understand ourselves so again, how we begin to s move forward towards some idea of, of believable truth and justice, mm -hmm. and the fact that these crises are not unique to us, mm -hmm. yeah, and they have to do with forces that impose on us that in fact are worldwide in their scope. Okay. If I Thanks very much. <coughs> if I may yeah. pick up from there. Um, the thanks for these questions. They, they really are an extraordinary set, and uh, they raise issues far beyond uh, what we may even hope to, to consider today. But uh, I'd like to pick up on Jean's last point. The point about the book, in a profound sense, arises out of our earlier work on theory from the South. We started working on crime in South Africa in, in the late 90s. Uh, we started doing it ethnographically. We did, um, we did beat policing in the Northwest. We spent enormous amount of time in cop stations, et cetera, et cetera. And we decided to do it outside of South Africa's major urban centers because a large proportion of South Africa lives outside of those, those centers. And we tend to look at the country in a very Johannesburg, Cape Town centric way. And the country doesn't look the same everywhere by any manner of means. You're quite right. There are many South Africans. Um, and it is always hubris to talk about South Africa. South Africa, in a sense, is a crime, right? It is the crime of, of apartheid, which has not recovered from itself yet. And looking at it from what was then a Bantustan gave us a very profound insight. But what we became constantly aware of was that many of the things we were seeing there, we were also seeing in Chicago, on the south side, in our neighborhood, which is a majority black neighborhood, which has many of the social issues, social pathologies, issues of race, issues of class that we, we encounter in South Africa. And we realized we could understand America much better from South Africa than we could understand South Africa from America. That the kinds of theory, the kinds of, of vision uh, that, that we were bringing to the subject really was centered in what we're seeing every day in that country. And the book grew out of the notion, precisely Jean's point, uh, not simply that South Africa isn't exceptional, but that the world isn't exceptional. That is to say that we've seen phenomena that at one the same time, microcosmic, that engage people deeply wherever they are. After all, being murdered in Cape Town is no different from being murdered on the south side of Chicago. It creates the same pathologies of race, of class, of family, um, etc. It creates exactly the same psycho and social dynamics and is denied in many of the same ways. Um, and so understanding both, as it were, the global issues involved here and the local issues involved and seeing them as dialectically entailed in one another became the project of the book. It was another moment of theory from the South. It was another moment of understanding the world from an eth ethnographic presence in South Africa where, in effect, m many of the ways we talk about these things are much more express, 
much more frank, much more uh, hurtful in a way, but also revealing than they are in the States, where in effect um, there is no public sphere of conversation. There are only microspheres divided by political ideology. Uh, America doesn't have a unitary democracy by any manner of means. Anybody who thinks about American democracy in the same words uh, needs <laughs> some re-education, <laughs> foundational re-education. There's no Habermasian public sphere in, um, in America at all. Conservatives talk to conservatives, liberals talk to liberals, and, and the left cry in universities. Um, <laughs> there is no space of real, real discourse. So understand it, so this book is, it tries to capture, I mean, Gene says we're not exceptional. You know, in South Africa, we are living in Ca Cape Town in the Northwest constantly. The cops never arrest anybody. Actually, police arrest rates here are no different, literally no different, 0.1% in either direction of France or England or America. Uh, rates of the, uh, for example, rates of conviction for rape, we think are very low in this country. In the States, they're 2%, okay? And that only c accounts for reported rapes, which are actually probably lower there than they are here. Why? Because male violence, especially in the South, uh, especially uh, among white populations, ironically, um, is taken to be endemic and is not reported to police at all. So many of the things we think are deeply particular have to do with the condition of the prison. As Jean said, uh, part of this was an attempt to, to capture what has happened to the history of the present. What has happened to the notion of the social? What has happened to the notion of the self? What has happened to triangulation between capital governance and the state? Beca uh, because it's that, tr that um, uh, triangulation that really uh, underlies much of what we're seeing about debates about crime and the notion, as Jean said, of truths being, as it were, fabricated, constructed, validated through discourses of crime. Now, this takes me to, to one of Sarah's sp specific points that I think is really important, and that is this all goes along with a foundational moment in the history of the present almost everywhere, and that is the, the hyperextension of the law into everyday life, right? Um, we wrote a book called Law and Disorder in the Post-Colony uh, a few years back, which talks about the fetishism of the law, and it relates this to the neoliberalization of the present and the sense of a loss of the concept of the social and of society uh, that, uh, as we joke in the book, that great philosopher of the 20, late 20th century, Margaret Thatcher, um, <laughs> declared in that great philosophical journal, um, the, the Women's Home Journal in Britain, uh, that society <laughs> was dead. Uh, sometimes reading Women's Home Journal tells you more about the world <laughs> than reading the American ethnologist, believe me. Um, Margaret Thatcher was not uh, founding a principle, she was echoing a moment. She was echoing a moment in which the attack on the social by the right had become part of the neoliberal, the Thatcher-Reagan moment, which gave us part of this, this triangulation. The notion of society is dead. We're all individuals. The metaphors for being social in the world are things like the network, it's, um, social media, etc. We know each other not through an, uh, an idea, a Durkheimian idea of moral solidarity, but rather of co the connectedness of interested individuals. And what that produces is a, wor a world of hyper-extended contractual relations. We live in a world of contract. Uh, so much of ordinary sociality, of ordinary politics has migrated to the courts. We live in a world of hyper-extended leg uh, legality. Now fetuses can sue, sue their mothers, right? Uh, dogs can sue their owners, literally. Uh, gods in India can sue uh, their, their, their followers. Um, much of politics has migrated into the courts, as we know from this country. I uh, read the paper every day, and all we're reading about is how things are moving through the court system in one form or another. And what that produces, and what that is, is, as it were, the other side of the concern about criminality. Because, after all, if we live in a hyperextended world of, of legality, its dialectical um, negation is illegality. And very often, of course, illegality is itself about profit making. It has a material existence. We're, uh, we're describing in our class early this morning uh, that the, the most fervent supporters of drug legislation in the US are the Southern American drug cartels. After all, Coke that costs what it costs because it's illegal is of much greater value to a, uh, to a criminal cartel than Coke that you can buy in a store in Amsterdam. Right? Legality and illegality are foundationally part of the way that capitalist economies work. And this, the relationship between the two is what foundationally the 
notion of the truth about crime is. Politics has become about drawing the line between the legal and the illegal. What happened to Lula when he was dis deposed or Dilma? They were accused of corruption. What's happened to, to the successor? Accused of corruption. What is, uh, what is happening to, to um, uh, Mr. Trump? Suit after suit being, um, being lodged in New York State over his corruption. Trump University, Leo, et cetera, et cetera. Po corruption becomes the way of dealing with political delegitimation. What did Trump tell us all the time through he, uh, his, his election campaign? Crooked Hillary, the moment I get into power, she becomes a criminal. Why? Because ultimately power is a capacity to draw the line. You raise Guantanamo Bay. Um, the, the, the Bush administration was extremely interesting on Guantanamo Bay. Why? They wanted to torture prisoners who they had no cases on at all. And what they did was they declared laws that they knew were going to be declared illegal by their own Supreme Court. But the law takes two years to work in the state. Mm -hmm. Takes two years between a, um, a, an executive order and its declaration of illegality in the Supreme Court. That two years is a legal black hole. It was during those two years that, in effect, the US um, Army, under direct uh, orders of the Bush administration, tortured people, killed people, and violated people. When the two years was up, they declared another law, knowing they'd have two, two more years. Legal, uh, Hyper-legal worlds create all kinds of black holes, all kinds of possibilities, and all kinds of capacities for reimagining truths. So the hyper-legality and the, the line drawing between the two is foundational to a world in which one assumes that the social order is no longer a moral order, that is no longer, it's no longer there, it's only one made up of, and what goes with this also, of course, it are forms of jurisprudence which don't recognize social causes mm -hmm. and which allow, for example, for the fact in America that if you're a 14-year-old and you're caught for a drug offense, if you're white, you go to therapy, if you're black, you go to prison. Mm -hmm. And that's a correlation. It's a direct correlation. Um, and what is that? That's another form of drawing the line, right? Race itself becomes criminalized by virtue of drawing the line. Poverty itself becomes criminalized. Y you know what proportion of Americans are in prison because they cannot afford the fees and fines that accrue to them as criminals? Approximately 340,000. 340,000 people are in prison with long-term sentences in the States because they can't afford to pay. And those crimes are administered by the private sector in the name of the state. In other words, crime is hugely profitable. It is about the workings of capital. America has three, almost three million, um, three million incarcerated people. Their bodies are a form of capital like very few others. Now even, you want to make money in America, now you invest in um, the, the uh, probation industry. Why? Because many states are legal, and probation is also in the private sector. And private sector shares in probation companies have skyrocketed over the last three or four years as states have moved people out of prison into the probation sector. Somebody's got to manage them. Uh, to manage a prison a day, you get paid something like, uh, I think it's now $140 a day for doing basically nothing except looking at a, a thing and ticking off that you've checked the, the, the um, chip in their foot. Um, and so this becomes a form of new forms of slavery around race, poverty, etc. The story uh, stories go on and on. And this is what we try to capture. The, uh, why crime has become what it has and how it emerges out of those triangulations and why it has to do so much with um, a, a new form of sociality which exists in a different kind of space and in a hyper-legal space. Um, and that goes to also the question of what kind of self, the confessional, forensic self. Actually, that's a very interesting issue because we live in a world in which we have actually fetishized the forensic. Actually, in policing, Forensics works great on CSI. <laughs> it works terrifically on the victim's unit, et cetera, et cetera. It works terribly in policing. Uh, any cop in the States will tell you that you can use forensics to negate criminal action, but you can't use it to prove anything um, because basically you can always destroy um, forensic evidence. The, uh, and we, talk, we haven't talked at all here about policing, half the book's about policing, um, but policing has become more and more impossible. It's known as the impossible mandate, technically among cops. It's moved from, in fact, most p policing to managing populations. Policing has become about public order because most ordinary policing has moved into the private sector. 66% uh, of policing in the States, 67% of policing in South Africa is done in the private sector. Okay, so the idea that it's police that protect society is mythical. Um, the, the, the remaining policing is addressed mainly to public order and public order protection of corporate property. 
Those two things being seen the same because we treat corporate property as though it were a social good, not as a private, private value. Um, what that means is in the middle, what is shrunk and moved is detection. Detection, uh, Jackie Salibi basically destroyed South Africa's uh, detective services on the grounds that we were going to go into crime prevention rather than try to make impossible the possible. And South Africa's uh, detective forces were absolutely um, destroyed. They're now being, it's, it's sort of an effort to recreate them. But what this means that most policing is not about that at all. Policing for that purpose of detection is really about s insurance. Uh, people go to the cops here and everywhere else. To, my car was hijacked, here's the piece of paper, you go to your insurance company, etc. The chance of anybody ever thinking that the hijack is going to be caught is somewhere between zero and zero. Um, and so it's not about that. It's about literally moving paper for redistributions <laughs> of, 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 fi of finance. Policing has changed foundationally. And the notion of the, the, the self-involved here is very much a cipher. It's actually um, a, a self which is reduced to, again, to, to, to uh, the algorithmic and to the biological. More and more, policing is about trying to sort out who is going to commit crimes and preventing it from happening. Um, I g what was it, uh, that wonderful film um, about catch, uh, catching Minority criminals? Report. Pardon? Sorry? Minority Report. Minority Report, thank you, yes. Minority Report was exactly about this, the idea that you could catch criminals before cr crimes were ever committed if only you had the biological um, wherewithal to do it. And that's where so much of the social sciences is being attacked right now, precisely by the notion of bio 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 uh, uh, biological economics, biological forensics, etc., are all seeing in the, in the human the possibility of locating ourselves in a totally forensic self. Th that self, however, tends to be entirely algorithmic. And what is interesting about the algorithmic, uh, it, it hinges on the triumph of economics, the idea that the only truth is the truth in the number. Well, show a social scientist a number that she or he can't uh, deconstruct, and they need further training. <laughs> uh, there is no number that you can't deconstruct. Numbers are themselves lies. Why? Because they're abstractions. They abstract populations and extract the diacritica that associate. So algorithmic knowledge is itself a huge reduction of the human into the notion of the possibility of knowing the condition of humankind by virtue of basically eliminating the human and simply aggregating what one thinks the human, and it's all predicated on a magic, the magic of probability. The magic of probability is based on the pr uh, presumption that what has happened in the past is going to happen proportionately the same in the future. Well, we all know from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that that's garbage. We also know that from, from Statistics 101. Toss a coin 99 times, come up 99 heads, the, the, the 100th time is still a 50% chance. Uh, the idea that it would be anything different, which is what probability theory assumes for purposes of, of uh, especially the insurance and the finance industry, is false. And yet we e erect an entire economy on it. Fake news is not simply the fakery of Mr. Trump. It's not simply the fakery of Mr. Murdoch. It's not simply the notion that the world is a lie. I'll tell you and I'm powerful and therefore it will be true which is foundational to much of contemporary politics, but it rather lies in the very notion that we live in a probabilistic world, in a world that we can know each other, and in a way, the truth about crime, precisely because it's a space in which we try to establish knowable things in the world, and precisely by virtue of breach of negation and so on, becomes such a powerful metaphor. Is it the only metaphor? <coughs> no, Sarah, you're absolutely right, it's not the only metaphor but it's a deeply enduring one. Recall the history of South Africa. We had AIDS, we've, we've had um, ecological stuff, and all kinds of, of moments of trauma. We also have opportunity and various, uh, of course, the, the, dif the difference between crime and opportunity is an interesting one. For many people in South Africa, crime is opportunity, and opportunity is crime. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, the crime keeps reoccurring, just as it does in the States, just as it does in Europe, just as it does in Britain, just as it does even in Singapore, where there's hardly any. Um, and so it is precisely an argumentative zone for that production. And that's what the book tries to get at. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I didn't really need to introduce all, <laughs> all of our presenters, because you know what you're going to get. And it's really <laughs> fantastic um, material to work with. But what I could do is give you both if you want to take the opportunity to just do a very brief response before we open it up, or we can go no, straight. No, I, I Should we, you, you're all right? Or do you want to? Not to hear. 
Yeah. Do them. Oh, so not necessarily. <laughs> so that's right. Okay. So let's open it up. We have more than enough time for discussion. We're going to go beyond 2.30. At 2.30, um, which is the normal time when we end, um, we will accept that a few of you may need to go, but we'll continue till uh, 2.45. So we've got half an hour. Unfortunately, it's a product of the fact that we have such fantastic speakers that we lost a few minutes along the way by moving to this location. And I'd just like to uh, thank Political Science for giving us this space uh, in, in a short period of time, and also to mention um, Ashilin Bemba's uh, book launch this evening at the Book Lounge. They probably also will need to find another venue. <laughs> It's close to Greenfield, so you can walk directly there if you need to. <laughs> okay, so let's take a round of three to four comments, questions, and we'll, we'll get responses mm -hmm. to that. And could you please just mention your name and then go into your comment or question? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, for the wonderful book. Uh, it sounds so interesting. My name is John. <laughs> um, I'm from Makere University in Kampala. Oh, great. Um, I'm here for a short visit of this university. Uh, from uh, the last speaker's presentation, I realized that uh, the whole book is about something like what everybody here said about law, about the myth of uh, what you may call the myth of the rule of law. Uh, the fact that uh, we always believe that the law and the legal system they play in certain ways to arrive at justice, but we can never be sure because, as uh, uh, Carl Lewis puts it, that laws are kind of fake things, uh, fictional things. And laws fall in the same, uh, in the same vein uh, uh, with Game of Thrones, uh, Roman dignitaries are in the same vein. Uh, justice in their homes, uh, so much justice for the country in the world. They all uh, had this kind of uh, cynicism about the law and how legal systems operate. But at the end of the day, uh, we realize that the truth, if you study about how political systems and legal systems operate, your book is just photo. But the problem is how can we go around all these imperfections within the way our political systems and legal systems are actually operate? Wow, that's a terrific question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, are, we more? are we taking more? Okay. Yeah, then let's take. Uh, Another two or so comments, questions. Oh, okay, in while he, yeah, you have to. Well, yeah. I'm oh, David Simpson, uh, University of California, David. Um, there was a I haven't read the book, so my apologies if I've screwed up. But there was a faintly kind of affirmative note to your reading of the 19th century detective story of the world in which somehow things could be made right. Um, in fiction. Yes, in fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I just wanted to say two things. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, of course, in the post story as in Holmes and all the other, and so many other things, the police never do get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, constantly yeah. screw up. Yeah. And the agency of truth finding has to come from outside the law exactly. and essentially from the amateur. Um, and secondly, you know, Doyle made no money from his home stories until the Ripper event, uh, yeah. which, of course, was an unsolved crime. And at which point everybody got interested in the whole issue yeah. of detection yeah. and security. Yeah. Mm. So I really just not to kind of in a silly way catch you out on reading yeah. the 19th century, but to really raise the question about the larger serialization. Mm -hmm. uh, how much uh, you would really defend the absolute departure of the contemporary from a rather longer term uh, question about the relation between crime and freedom and legal systems, okay. uh, which I think is arguably more similar in the 19th century, is more like the, the present in the 19th century than in perhaps in the previous three years. Assuming the 19th century isn't in unit either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Fiction is a crime yeah. in the 19th yeah. century. Yeah, I know that. Fiction is a crime. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and if you could introduce. Uh, I know it's Paul, but I'm in Francis in Cornwall from the Sea Lab. You talk about uh, law and uh, the justice system. So, uh, just a question, isn't the justice system uh, being used to seize power because justice system is one of the pillars of democracy that we say, and that's 
Okay. Uh, you take start, the middle one. Yeah, I'll take the other two. Start with your he gave a highly, and I, I, I hope you'll have a chance to read the book. He's oh, a highly truncated uh, 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 account here, and, and the longer arc uh, is something which Ernst Mandel has made an argument about in a delightful book called *Delightful Murder*. Mm -hmm. I really, I don't know if any Mandel is known for any other things, <laughs> but it is a kind of materialist history of crime fiction. And he makes an incredibly important point, which resonated uh, with something that we began to notice in um, American crime fiction, particularly again coming back to Ashwood. We live in a filmic moment, yeah. So that, uh, and in fact, the interrelationship now between between literature and television and film, the same people work, uh, the same writers, the same financiers circulate, and also between fiction and, and non-fiction, as you were suggesting. But Mandela's point is in the early modern period, the period of Robin Hood and the Piccolo, you know, you had a very strong sense that the social bandit was a kind of figure who resisted the enclosures of the bourgeois law and the property regime. And that there was a kind of heroics. Now, there's been, of course, a whole literature subsequently pointing out that there's nothing to romanticize the social bandit. But the point that was made there was that there was a kind of, si there was a sense in which uh, the nature of crime and also policing was very much a, s a domain of political argument. It was unsettled in terms of any kind of simple hegemony, it particularly in terms of which the state triumphed or the plot was fixed. Now, when one goes forward, I don't know if you know an, a, 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 a book by Summerstill, or Winfred Summerstill, which is about detection in the late 19th century. He uses one or two key cases. It's called The Suspicions of Bristol Witcher. Mm -hmm. And Witcher was regarded, he worked for, the, for, the, for, uh, for Scotland, Scotland Yard, yeah. as the first kind of modern detective. And there was a, a, a crime called the Road Hill Murder, which was kind of classically wonderful because it was an in-house, somebody within an extended domestic family murders a child. Right? And, and, and what that book looks to, and, and it, it resonates with Franco Moretti, the Italian, who writes also about these things. Right? But what's emerging at this point is a kind of story that's tentatively trying to suggest right, that there's a way in which we can know our world and begin to separate out uh, the known if you like, domains of, of, of insurrection, of deviance, the sites of order, and we can read our population in terms of nationals and immigrants, uh, uh, dangerous classes, uh, and, 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 and uh, the, the respectable bourgeoisie and so on. And the point that's being made there is that in life, the detective doesn't succeed. But in fiction, uh, there's an effort constantly to suggest that in fact we can succeed. And we can succeed because of a certain kind of preternatural uh, 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 insight that comes from ultimately knowing the social world right, and being able to deduce from it and following its rules uh, absolutely religiously. The knowledge is almost all sociological. Right. And very often it depends ultimately either on sometimes the, the, the surreal or, or even the, the inspired, you know, the supernatural, but certainly the person who was so good at reading the, 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 the social cues that their knowledge was almost preternatural. But almost at the same time yeah. right, comes this kind of uh, 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 a form of, 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 of fiction writing, you know, of, of, of um, crime no, uh, uh, liter literature that is saying something different. This is the kind of the critical noir yeah. that has always been there and has emerged in interesting times. Yeah. This was the time of World War I, very strongly in the Depression in America. Yeah. Uh, and as things begin to unravel, in the late 20th century. And that is a form which casts doubt, yeah, but uses the crime fiction yeah, because of its established uh, uh, status and also because of the nature of its plot to raise questions about who knows and who can solve and how ultimately the only people that can, so that can, 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 can save the forensic, can, can enforce the law are those who actually have broken it themselves or know how to break it. Mm -hmm. The shadower figure of the gumshoe, you know, the, 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 the kind of um, yellow pulp fiction kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, in investigator, but also a whole kind of way of looking at crime fiction yeah. as a way of pointing to where the true crime lies. So that, for instance, when the depression in America, C.L.R. James, the Caribbean critic, has written wonderfully about mm -hmm. this, that that kind of fiction 
is actually showing you know, the, the poverty of the law and the failure ultimately of the promise of American democracy to deliver. So that it creates a group of criminals who in fact are fit for risk. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And they themselves have a, a, in a sense a legitimate right. Now, what we are arguing in the book, in fact, is that these two things exist in tensile relationship over the historical period. What's emerged in the late 20th <coughs> century, the world, as we were saying in the class today, of Breaking Bad, the world of, of, of The Sopranos, the world of the kind of counter hero of the crime that's never solved, yeah, mm -hmm. is a very strong, I mean, the world is writing noir everywhere. Yeah, and, and that kind of fiction is becoming, I mean, you look at ranking in Scotland, people saying the new Scottish dilemma is understood better in his crime writing than it is in any kind of uh, political or social science. Right? But at the same time, you have CSI. You have the sense in which, in the fantasy world, we may want to read about yeah, our social realism, not in the great novels of South Africa now, but, but in a new kind of the Dion Mayers of this world, right? and a whole new w wonderful group of black crime writers and movies. But we also often watch at night at home behind our burglar alarmed windows <laughs> yeah, the kind of CSI type fiction where if in fantasy is not in life, the crime can be solved. But increasingly, in the point, we have a, a, a chapter here called Divine Deflection. We make the point mm -hmm. that, in fact, the very fact that both in fiction and in life, by the way, Scotland Yard who these days have all kinds of trainers in what they see to be surreal techniques of face detection and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that, that, that is not enough. Uh, and that, in fact, the question of the, 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 the inefficiency, if you like, the incapacity of the law to really know, or its corruptibility, is at the center. So it's a, it's a, it's a field of, 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 of play in which you have these two different kinds of crime fiction. And they work themselves out very subtly over the, the period. But we've got an emergence now and then of this kind of early modern picaresque fiction. Yeah, and that sense that, in fact, it's out there. Policing is impossible. Yeah, crime is really never solvable. And in fact, the criminal hero may, in fact, have more justice in terms of the eyes of the populace in the kind of Benjaminian sense of the great criminal. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, it, 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 one of the things that struck us when we were writing Divine Detection was um, announced by Scotland Yard that they'd hired 400 magicians, conjurers, over the last decade to teach the detectives how to think laterally. Um, <laughs> it's really, uh, the, the amount of magicality in policing is, is huge. Uh, uh, that's nothing. Uh, to the two legal questions, uh, John, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, legal realism has triumphed in the nature of the law. Legal positivism, however, remains ideologically what power tries to hide behind much of the time. That takes us to the, the third question. We'll come back to you in a moment. How does one fix it? I mean, that, that's the, the great question of the future, right? And you're not looking at God. You're looking at a poor uh, anthropologist who uh, doesn't do uh, prognostication terribly well. But some things seem very clear. I mean, you know, uh, Foucault ri wrote that society must be defended, uh, and he meant it in a very particular way. Uh, but as the um, left is reasserting itself in Europe now, and especially in England, uh, as the Sanders moment showed, uh, there is a flight, especially among younger generations, back to the notion of a moral society, a political order that actually is democratic and that has respect for the law, um, that <coughs> finds the, the current moment in, in America and Europe extremely scary uh, and sees its future deeply, deeply at issue. Um, and in this sense, th that's the universal piece of the book, that in fact we do live in a very scary time. The very fact that Trump could be elected, which to most people was unthinkable, except for, you know, um, yes. no. Well, yeah, I predicted it, but that's wrong. <laughs> but uh, to the 68 million people, yes, I did, I'm ashamed to say, uh, 68 million Americans voted for him uh, is the scarier part of the whole thing. Um, so the, the notion of, of re-theorizing the social, re-theorizing the state, re-theorizing re democracy, because in effect it has collapsed into forms of authoritarian populism in many parts of the world, um, the, the time has come for a, a new generation to grab hold of this question as a serious issue of the way that the, the critical left, and I don't mean a Marxist, but seen a critical left has got to think about the world. And we're seeing slowly a return to a form of etatism, Right, which says what kind of state ought to exist that isn't merely a meta business, right? As as states have become more and more, but actually leaves the corporate sector and re-enters, as it were, the moral economy sector. How, in effect, we think about redistribution, how we think about new forms of of, of actually.
capturing capital in ways that have uh, been totally evacuated over the last decade. So those are the big challenges, and the time has come for that conversation, not squabbling about w is Mr. Trump right or wrong. That's clear. Nor is Mr. Zuma guilty of corruption or not. Those are, those are proximate questions. The bigger questions are precisely how is society to be, to be defended? How is the state to be recaptured? How is the law to become positivist and not merely a tool? And this goes to, to the second question. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, and I apologize. Um, but yes, law um, if power is about seizing the law, but it's about seizing law in two ways. I mean, you know, um, uh, Carl Schmitt made the point a very long time ago that sovereignty is the capacity to suspend the law and, in effect, to break it, um, to make it and remake it in, in one's image, to, to claim the exception. And th power has always, I mean, th that's what we meant by saying politics and power finally is about the capacity to draw the line. Um, because that is precisely what asserting the law or suspending it is all about. But power plays with the law in very interesting kinds of ways um, because often it hides behind forms of constitutions. One of the things that w w has been very interesting is the way the constitutions are used to justify power. Um, for example, uh, Robert Mugabe <coughs> changed the constitution 14 times in Zimbabwe in a decade in order to validate new forms of police action. Okay? Now, he didn't need to do it. Right? He certainly had the kind of state power that could have suspended the law without claiming the constitution. But by claiming constitutionality, what he was doing was talking laterally to other governments in the world, to the United Nations, to the world that speaks the language of the law. So conjuring it in the name of power and in the name of legitimacy is itself a complex language in global discourse as well as it is in managing populations. There's another form, though, of seizing the law. It doesn't have to do with the state, but it has to do with police. Uh, and that's a very serious issue because, as we've seen in, in America, the police kill a lot of people without any real judicial comeback. Um, in fact, we, we know the celebrated cases because they hit uh, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there are websites in the States that keep <coughs> count of the number of black Americans that are killed by the cops, and it runs to the hundreds every year. Right? It's not a minor figure. And what is at issue there is the devolution of the power to break the law down to the... Uh, to, to micro-policing, which has itself become highly militarized, which has itself become extremely oppressive. Um, and uh, cops themselves, <coughs> there are any number now of accounts of cops who know the language of impunity and know how to mobilize it. And know, uh, you notice uh, they killed the, an Australian woman a few days ago. And conveniently, the, their body cams were switched off. That's illegal, but nobody's going to prison for it. Right, uh, and so and this this echoes and goes back again, if one may think back in historical time, to Benjamin's point about uh, police being <coughs> um, enabled to make the law at the time that they are allegedly enforcing it. That police operate where the state runs out. That police are a ghostly presence with a huge capacity of violence. And as we know, our police force in this country kill a lot of people too. The number of lawsuits. <coughs> in, in billions of, do of, of, of rand that um, uh, SAPS are facing right now is quite legendary. It stands out even on global scales. It's not the top. Um, it's about fourth or fifth, but it's right up there. Uh, and that's because, again, s the state does not, in effect, um, or at least opens up the zone of um, impunity and of lawmaking to the police who sees both justice and the law in, in effect invoking and enacting their power. Let's take a, another round. Um, questions, comments? Yeah. Sorry, you can't hear. Uh, louder, please. Sorry. You can't hear. You can't hear me. No. no. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> Many of your uh, points were about the 
history of detection and the fascination that you have with the figure of the detector solving mysteries for us mm -hmm. and the things that puzzle us. And I wonder if in your study of both the literature and of, of the actual cases, if this ever came up, which is why actually do we have a fascination with solving a crime, the taking of a life, which is something that is lost by thousands every day in any time, yeah. which is going to be lost universally. And yet, in a way, the mystery is not, the real mystery might be solved. Mm -hmm. Not to be why someone is killed or dies before they're connected, but why that person is alive and still. Mm -hmm. And what kind of figure, what kind of detective then would it be that would look at a reversal and say, why are we here? And would we have the same fascination for why people are here, whether they die before their time or they die after their time? There's a Davy Schuster yeah. story uh, that was made into a wonderful film of the film called The Inspector Call. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. That, that deals with class and deals with a working class detective very humble and modest coming to a company in a mansion where they dismiss him, but he keeps asking these very simple and quiet questions about what is there, and the implication under the, under the narrative is indeed that it isn't so much these, this rich family that's killed him, nor is there a um, society But it is the work somehow the the workings of uh, uh, a uh, supreme being that is behind it. Yeah. So if you have thought about this in any way, I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Okay. It's a fascinating. Right, let's take, yeah, take another. Take a couple of yeah. Yeah. More. Hi, my name is Davide from Davide from Davide from Davide from Davide from and I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit more on the on your notion of sovereignty. So if you can, uh, how would you theorize sovereignty to sort of call for a new way of theorizing it, and especially in relation to between uh, uh, legitimacy, so the, the power of legitimacy, and then the bodies that are actually charged at the capacity to uh, exercise that legitimacy. Okay. So would you be a bit into changing that uh, yeah. from emerging from your case? Thank you. Uh, third and final? Yes. Hello, um, my name is Lulu. I'm a student in the Department of General Linguistics at Stellenbosch University. Um, I was hoping that we could address Professor Nuttall's point about the sociality of crime as such. And um, maybe I can expand on that to say the like um, crime as embodied, the corporeal experience of crime, and what that could add to a discourse um, of ethnographic or anthropological yeah. Okay, you take a question, okay. so that I'll take a second. Uh, yeah, um, the question about about life and detection is fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating, because in some senses it seems to me we will get to the point of, of sovereignty in a while. But a good deal of this has to do with the kind of sense that the, 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 the sovereignty of the absolute and to be the extreme sovereign of a kind of godhead, as it were, yeah. is always an issue in humanist society. So the law stands in, the king stands in, yeah. society and, and, and the sovereignty of the people stands in. Yeah. But this question of who gives and who takes life yeah. and what life means in itself is always being displaced in a kind of post-theological world, it seems to me into these kinds of questions, right? Yeah. The law of man, the law of God, 
the meaning of life and, 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 and taking it away. And it seems to me there that, first of all, the idea of detection stands in for so many things. You know, it is a capacity within the canons of a certain kind of sociological uh, form of, of knowing and being to, begin to get to the bottom of things, to try and understand. Now, the other side, of course, of the whole question of, of death and pathology is the question of normativity. You know, what makes life? Everything from the Malthusian sense of population and what governs its, its, its rise to the sense in Victorian England, right, in a rapidly urbanizing societies where public health is being born mm -hmm. right, and where humoral theories are at play in trying to understand why great <coughs> diseases rot, rot through a population and life expectancy varies between different populations and so on. That there's that sense of trying to know right, both life and death as two sides of a kind of form of regulated social knowing and social management and social engineering and increasingly biophysical knowledge as well. Right? And again, I come back to this idea of the clinic, the body on the slab. Foucault's clinic is not only about the birth of a certain kind of biological uh, 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 certainty and a form of knowledge where the body becomes its own measure, as it were, and death becomes a limit, but it also, he says, is a paradigm for forms of other kinds of knowing, right? not only for the sciences, but for the social sciences and the whole empirical method of trying to read on the surface what pathologies lie at the bottom and form regular laws about them. So there's a whole sense there, it seems to me, of what the detective stands in for mm. right? in, that, in, that, in that way. And also, the different places where, for instance, film, uh, the, 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 the Noir detection, de, 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 uh, detection of the 1930s involved underclass detectives, people who had not been in the police before, trying to feel the parameters. And a lot of the time when they walk into a room where there's a body lying, they just they, they suddenly <coughs> distracted by the fact of, my God, how these people live. You know, the, the, the opulence, the furnishings, the air, the whole. So there's a sense there, you know, the whole qualities, the relativity of life and death. Uh, in which the body on the, on, on the floor is almost incidental. Right? So there's a sense there, I think, of the kind of philosophical work that's being done, which is why so often, I think, the supernatural right, comes into what we would call the, 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 the divine qualities come into detection. Right? And a lot of the ways in which people appeal increasingly in our world that is the, of where there's a turn, again, to seeking sovereignty in forms of theology of one kind or another, you know, we have an occult-related crimes unit in South Africa. We thought this was a unique oddity about our exceptionalism until we realized that they copied the idea from the southern U.S., where Pentecostal beat cops had been seeing the hand of Satanism as a player in multifactorial crimes for a very long time. Right? So all of this comes into it. It's a philosophical system. But there are places, it seems to me, where you see this question of the quality and the relative quality of life very clearly. In civil suits, for instance, where damages are laid, uh, where a child has been, for instance, uh, uh, damaged in an accident, right? or somebody has some kind of an attack where their ability to function normally right, is, 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 is impaired and damages are awarded. There's a whole kind of knowledge that's emerged about the value of a life. And there's been, as of after 9-11, this came very much to the fore when compensatory funds in the US were, were, were given out according to people who lost their lives in those buildings, yeah, state funds. And there was a whole rule of thumb as to what those lives were worth, mm -hmm. according to their occupation, what they might have earned, their class. And there was a whole counter dispute. There were a series of, 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 of class action suits that emerged uh, over what this revealed about the value of the life uh, of, and, and, and the quality of, of, of black life as against white life and professional life as against manual life. So there's a whole set of issues there that, again, and this is what we mean about how truth is produced through crime, not only through solving the murder, but as a byproduct of all of these forms of knowledge that are called into action and have to be invented and come into the cold light of where law, for instance, meets you know, uh, finance capital by the economics. So I think there's a very interesting set of things there uh, that, that, that come out. And then, of course, there's the whole question of who or who doesn't even come into the arc of forensic inquiry. You know, it's been largely a bourgeois thing, right? It's been re re related to life that is valued, that, that, you know, that is registered, that, that, that commands the, the attention of the state. We know that thousands of bodies are not even counted in the murder uh, uh, rates of, of countries because they think it is so 
found along the way. They died without claim. They died without dignity. They died because they did not count. So all of this research seems to me comes into this question uh, that you're asking, and it's a really interesting one. But there is a sense, I think, in which we see increasingly that the figure of the detection, the idea of detection as a form of knowing and forensics, goes far beyond simply the idea of crime and, and policing, even of murder, which again is a whole issue that turns around things like the death penalty and the way in which, without something that we <coughs> see to be in its, a, a, a godly sovereignty, we try and put value on life and death and hold accountable somebody uh, for, for, for its damage and its harm and its community. Yeah, can I uh, ask you a question? Yeah, the, 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 <coughs> yeah the, the, the previous, previous question. Yeah. Uh, your question is fascinating. It comes back to something you didn't um, answer, um, Sarah. Sarah. Although we do discuss that quite a few in the book. Yeah. Um, I would say less, and I mean, I would go to this less um, out of a kind of reciprocal humanity that emerges in crime scenes, although I think sometimes it does. And we have something called, you know, the, the Stockholm Syndrome, yeah? Or the Kathy Hurst phenomenon, where people who are actually abducted uh, and held captive and their freedom taken uh, by, by, you know, a criminal act of kidnapping become fixated on the kidnappers and become, so there's something that's in the intimacy of that act and that becomes a code of ethics. Where I think you can see it very clearly is in things like forms of informal justice. Yeah. Um, or we've, we've written some in this book uh, about uh, forms of, of, of what sometimes is called family justice, where, say, for instance, in a community, and we're talking about the Kayalicha tradition, and there's a lot of examples there, but that's not the only place, where somebody will suddenly shout out, somebody stole my purse, right? my bag is gone, and people appear. And there's a whole kind of orchestrated form, almost of, uh, you know, it's, it's like a ritual, where people suddenly come out and gather, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and often set upon um, a, a what is perceived to be the perpetrator, in ways that are, it seem to be incredibly violent and exact the form of sovereignty yeah, immediately over the, the, in the sense that they, they take control over the violent execution of justice, but in a context where everybody is literally in a face-to-face -face situation and ostensibly the perpetrator and the victim are right in front of each other and everybody witnesses the act and there's an immediate sort of uh, 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 execution of justice in a context where people feel that the law often takes forever and never comes to a conclusion. So there's a visible sense of retribution. But then often there is also a kind of ritual treatment. The body often is left to lie there as a kind of memento mori. Yeah. And people kind of watch it or it lies in the sun or eventually it's removed. And there's a whole kind of a, 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 a set of kind of ritualized experiences around that event. Now when you talk to people about experiences of crime, very often they will recount those kinds of things. And they have a kind of visceral immediacy. Yeah. And that's a more extreme form. We wrote about it. We said there was almost a kind of jouissance, you know, that sense almost of a kind of horrified pleasure in, in, in the direct kind of uh, ability to deal with these issues, to bring them out to the front and to exact the justice that, that is welling up in people who feel that the whole system, in a way, yeah, is depriving them of a sense of safety, security, and protection. So that's one of the kinds of, of, of things I would think about in that regard. Finally, on, on sovereignty, um, uh, this is, of course, a, a, an interesting question because social science has been so obsessed with arguing about the nature of sovereignty over the last decade or so, although, of course, um, the debate goes back a long way, into, um, certainly back to, to the, the 20s and 30s. Um, the term itself, of course, is used both strictly as a political term and as metaphorical basically um, as a loose metaphor for power. We don't mean it in that way at all. Um, in a fairly direct genealogy, I, I suspect that the line from us goes from Schmidt through Agamben and, uh, and Bataille, in that, the, in the sense, the strict sense, we see sovereignty as the effort by uh, an authority, however it's constituted, and I'll come back to that in a moment, to extend over uh, a population, sometimes it's not always geographically defined, uh, a population over which it controls the conditions of, um, of being, uh, of life and death, and, um, and in general tries to establish some either legal or simulacrum of a legal order, i.e. not merely uh, a killing field, 
Um, and the geographical, non-geographical has to do with the difference between localized sovereignties and, for example, global religious movements that claim sovereignty in all of those ways but are not territorial, they're super territorial. Um, but th that's the, the, the definitional issue. The sociological, socio-political, theoretical issue is more complicated. It's more complicated in the sense that political science 101 always theorized sovereignty as basically a, a form of political exclusivity, right? Uh, sovereignty 101 was that uh, uh, political science 101 had the sovereignty inhered in a state that was always vertical, pyramidal, and exclusive. Um, and basically, it controlled the conditions of life and death. Uh, as Benjamin said, ultimately, the death penalty, the capacity to demand uh, bodily sacrifice, corporeal sacrifice in, in war, et cetera, et cetera, were its ultimate indices. What has occurred, and this goes back to, to Sarah's point about what is new about sociality, about legality, et cetera, in the present. Um, one of the, uh, the, the aspects of the tectonic shift that has, and this is something, by the way, we deal with an extensa in law and disorder in the post-colony, is a tendency for vertical sovereignties to break down. And they've broken down largely in the neoliberal moment because of the outsourcing of so much of the functions of governance, including control over the means of violence. Very few nation states fight even their wars through their armies. They buy them. They, they do them through, through, and this is true of the states as well, by the way. Um, it fights a large proportion of its wars through private military contractors, um, just as it does so much of its policing. Uh, and in the spaces of so-called responsabilization, which is something Foucault talks about in The Rise of Neoliberalism uh, in, in his lectures, uh, under those conditions, the tendency for lateral sovereignties to attempt to take shape um, ac ac across space has become manifest in, in many, many contexts. So for example, if you, if you walk through the Cape Flats, okay, uh, there are things that are called gangs, a terrible term for forms of organized crime, which is a, you know, a, a socio-political form, that in fact are many states, uh, Lavender Hill, um, parts of Manenberg, etc., are controlled by these organizations, right? They run as many states, um, they, they extract, funding, states call it t um, taxation, uh, f in America it's called tribute, um, there are various forms, in the, but it's a form of extraction, and in return for that, what they offer is uh, a control over the means of violence, control over terrain, etc., etc., and some of them do establish forms of, of, of legality, courts, etc., etc. They begin to become more and more state-like. Mega churches do this all over the place. Uh, corporations do this all over the place. Enclaving, so much of, of, of southern Namibia is controlled by De Beers, who run it like a mini-state. They have their own police, their own courts, etc., etc., um, and they claim rights over uh, killing people who steal and transgress and run away, basically. Um, so these forms uh, have become lateralized, and they, they take on. And so this has occurred also, by the way, with ethnic populations. Um, qu claims of, of chiefs in this country uh, try and mess with, with uh, King Goodwill and see where it gets you. He thinks of the Zulu state as a sovereign within South Africa. And for a while, KwaZulu-Natal actually had a constitution which included a monarchy inside of it which is a little bit bizarre for a democratic nation state. So lateral sovereignties now occur all over. This is, is as much true in the States or in Britain as it is here, right? So that is what has, uh, what has emerged sociologically, and that's what we've got to theorize, because it's in those zones that the line between the criminal and, and the, the legal and the illegal are not controlled by the state, but are controlled by other organs. And so sovereignty, the devolution of sovereignty, creates a different kind of landscape of legality, illegality, and also of crime and policing, which is why so much policing has devolved, because it devolves with those sovereignties as well. Uh, American megachurches or higher police forces, um, they, so do, and, and in the same way as, as organized criminal gangs. We were living in the south side of Chicago. We were policed by, I think it was five police forces, Chicago Police Force, University of Chicago Police Force, the Black Muslim Police Force, Elijah Muhammad's group, three very well organized gangs um, and um, the feds sort of uh, and each one of them claimed to be the, the sovereign in, in the area and believe me nobody knew which one to call in the event of crime but actually the most effective were the black Muslim cops because they actually knew the neighborhood and knew what they were doing uh, they were the people that we could call <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much. I, we've reached that point. Oh. I, I really like to thank. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> I really like to thank uh, Professor Shimon Bember, Professor Sarah Nato, and Professor Jim Bantanya for an extraordinary event. We hope to have you back sometime in the future. you have all four of you have been very generous to us at this university in terms of engaging with our students and so on. I'd just like to mention next Thursday at one o'clock, we'll have um, Professor Michael Neal Cosmos from Rhodes University who will be giving a, a talk to us. And also he's written a new book, which you can go read and then engage with him there. Thanks very much. Thank you.